Amen. Y'all ready for the word? So it's, it's somebody on the stage. Let's see who it is. Let's see who it is. Let's Where's she at? She's got to get her glasses. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise for our sister Dolores as she comes and ministers the word. Faithful member of the Lighthouse for how, how many years? 22 years. Talk about rooted and grounded. My God. Amen. I believe she has something to say to us tonight. Amen. Amen. It's all yours. Bless you. Thank you so much for the opportunity tonight. I don't take it lightly. Y'all can sit down. I'm not very formal here. Actually, I'm not formal at all, so I get into trouble sometimes, but... I appreciate the opportunity, Pastor, and I'm very appreciative. Um, it's wonderful to be here and see what the Lord's doing awesome things. Um, a long time ago, he gave me visions of what's going to happen in this place, and everybody else has the same visions, the college and the dorm buildings, and but mine also includes a hotel for the conferences, and it also includes houses in between here and there and the five acres for families where the mother and the father and the children can live until they have enough money to buy their own house. So the, the vision is expanding, and uh, thank God I'm still here to see it. And I intend to be here a lot longer. I, you know, that's why I try to be healthy, because I really want to be here to see everything. But how does faith come? What's the scripture? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Because they've, they've always translated it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But actually, it's the word of Christ. And what is Christ? The burden removing, yoke destroying, power of God. Now, what the Lord wants me to talk about tonight is the joy of the word of Christ. For a long time, um, we've looked at the scripture that says, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. But that part of the scripture is actually not there. They added it later on because it was too good. It was too unbelievable that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. They had to put a, a condition on it so that it would fit religion. Religion doesn't believe that Jesus' sacrifice was enough. Religion believes that you have to add to the perfect work of Jesus Christ. But I digress. I, I have a lot of notes, and I asked the Lord to condense this because I know I have to go quickly. So I only have a few index cards. But another thing I want to point out to you is that whenever God cut a covenant with us, he put the person asleep. When Adam, when he was bringing his wife to him, what was Adam doing? Okay, and he, there was blood because he had to take the rib out and form the woman. And he had nothing to do with it. In fact, he didn't even choose his wife, but... Apparently, he was crazy about her because she was perfect for him. Imagine that. But, and then, that was in Genesis 2.21. Genesis 15.1, Abram. What was Abram doing when God told him to bring those animals, cut them in half, and then he was a burning lamp in between them? In Genesis 15.1, Abram was fast asleep. I wonder why that is. 
And then Genesis 28, 11, Jacob was asleep again, and he saw the Lord in a dream, and the Lord repeated his covenant, but Jacob was asleep. In Exodus, whenever Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt, when they complained about manna, did the Lord strike them, no food, did he strike them dead when they complained that they had no food? No. He provided manna. When they complained about no water, he didn't strike them down, kill them. He provided fresh water out of a rock, which symbolized Jesus. But at Mount Sinai, when he was calling the people to come to him, Exodus, they said, Moses, you go up because we're too terrified. You talk to him and you come back and tell us what he said. And so basically they, they rejected God. He wanted to be everything to them. There was already the covenant of grace, which is what I call it, before Jesus died because Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So apparently it was already at work even back then because it's outside of time. The work of atonement is outside of time and outside of place. The law was given by Moses, John 1, 17, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. If you know the truth, which is Jesus Christ, the truth will make you free. Hebrews 7, 19, the law made nothing perfect. And the New, Testament, the new Covenant is nothing like the old, test, old Covenant. In Jeremiah 31, 31, 34, it says, I will remember their sins no more. I will write my law on their hearts. They will never need anybody to teach them because I myself will teach them to know me. From the least to the greatest, they will know me. This was in Jeremiah. But then in Hebrews 10, 8, 12, Hebrews 8, 12 and 10, 17, he repeats it in the New Covenant because it was always meant to be from then. From, from the beginning to the end, he always meant to be closer than we, he was to Adam. We have a better covenant than we had with Adam. Adam walked with him in the cool of the day, and he called him God for one thing. But now he's our father, which is what he always intended to be. Jesus called God father, and nobody had called him or revealed him as father until Jesus himself came. That's why I always call him father, because Jesus paid a high price for that. And, and he's too close to call him God. It's so far away. And everybody calls on God. Only their gods are different. But nobody else calls their God father. Not in Hindu religion, not in the Muslim religion. They don't call him father. We are the only ones where our God is actually father. And we carry him around with us. He's not beside us. He's not in front of us. He's not behind us. He is inside and around us because we're in Christ and he's inside of us. And you can't separate the two. It's like when you mix salt together, can you separate it? When you mix the DNA together, can you separate it? But we are one. We're one spirit with him. In Jeremiah 17, 9, religion wants to point to the deceitful heart and to the wicked heart. But in Ezekiel 11, 19 and 36, 26, he promised, I will give them a new heart and a new spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2, 16, it says, we have the mind of Christ. It doesn't say we're going to have. He says, we have. Everything, everything in the kingdom of God is received by faith. And the believing, if you have the faith that you have it, you already have it, even if you can't see it. It's the title deed to the blessings that he's already given to us. Like you were talking about wives and houses and everything. It, if you're believing for it, and you, it's already yours. If you have the faith for it, it's already there. So start planning. Walk out in faith, start designing, start decorating, because God is going to come through for you. Because 
He watches over his word to perform it. Not only that, Phil Philippians 2.13, he causes us to will and to do his good pleasure. And what is the scripture over there? It says, being confident of this very thing, he who shall be faithful to complete it. So who's, who does it say is going to complete it? Who's inside of you that causes you to want to do what pleases him? Who's keeping both sides of the covenant in the new covenant? He is. In the old covenant, we did something and he did something. If you do this, then I'll do this. Now there is religious sayings that say, if you want something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. The truth is, you have to be something you've never been. Because Christianity is being, not doing. Many times we're so busy being, doing, because that's what we're used to. That's why Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Ever wonder why he said that? He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, one of the elite Pharisees who could check every box that I did everything perfectly, but he did nothing to receive the grace of God. In fact, he had to take off all of his qualifications, but he's not ashamed of it. He says, by the grace I, of God, I am who I am. It doesn't say, well, because of all these titles I have and all of these things I've earned and done, that I am who I am. What distracts us is our upbringing in the world system that says, I will be rewarded with this if I do this. Because that's not what God wants. He wants to live inside of you and you to love him and be crazy about him so much that all of your service, which is actually loving him, will come out of that relationship with him. That's why those people who were able to cast out demons in his name and everything, he said, how is that possible? How is that possible that they can do that and yet Jesus didn't know them? because there's power in the name of Jesus, whether you have a relationship or not, but just knowing about him will not save you. You have to know him intimately. In fact, once you taste a relationship with him, once you get used to the atmosphere of heaven, breathing the kingdom, even while you're here in this world, nothing else will satisfy you. The if your peace is affected, you'll know there's something wrong. You walk in peace already. You don't have to find peace. What are, it says we have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control already inside of us. That's like the other day when I was riding behind this very, very slow person. And I'm like, Jesus, Jesus, and, and, and inside of me, HS said, excuse me, Holy Spirit said, good thing you got patience. And I'm like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I do have patience. I have to use it. And so, therefore, I used the patience, and I settled down, and, and I blessed the person and prayed that they would get there safely and, and, you know. And so it's not something we have to attain. We don't have to say, Lord, give me more patience because it's already in there. I see it like an orange. You know, I'll bless you all of the different sections of an orange, it's a fruit, but it has sections. And so it's the same way that the fruit is. You get the whole thing. It doesn't just get, take a few pieces. You get everything inside of you. Um, Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it is... And so he gave us the measure of faith. We can't even produce the faith that pleases him, can we? It all comes from him. He does both sides of the covenant. That's why it's perfect. There's nothing. You can, can't look at the new covenant of grace and find anything that's wrong because he keeps both parts of it. He doesn't bless us based on our performance. He blesses us based on his. 
He doesn't bless us because we're good. He blesses us because he is. In fact, some people say, well, I got to be good so that God will bless me. But the truth is he blessed me even before I knew him. He saved me from many instances when I would have been dead before I knew him, before I even accepted him. That doesn't matter where you are, what you've done. It doesn't change your value. Just because you're a sheep in a pig's pen doesn't change you to a pig. Right? It doesn't change your value. So the gospel of grace is unimaginably good. In fact, in the scripture it said, I'm going to do something in your day that you wouldn't believe unless I told you. And so for 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they, they, they memorized all five books of the Pentateuch of Moses, studied the scripture, and when Jesus appeared, they didn't know him. They said, how can he be coming out of Bethlehem? He's supposed to be a Nazarene. And he did. And how can he come out of Egypt when he's supposed to be out of Bethlehem? Behold, Bethlehem, a star is rising. So they kept questioning rather than seeing what God was doing. It's possible to be in the presence of the Lord and not see him. Because we know that what we do not see is eternal, and it's the reality that we're going to wake up into one day. And what we see here is passing away and changing every moment. That's why he's outside of time. He's outside of time and place. He told me the other day because I was thinking about mom. Now she's always in the memory care and I'm always at work and even though I see her twice a day. But he said, you know, there's no difference. The same way that there's no distance in the spirit in time, there's no distance in the spirit in place because you are there with her because I'm there with her, and you're in me, and I'm in you, and you're there with her. So I'm like, thank you. That comforts. Doesn't that comfort anyone who, who's far away? When he, welco when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, w come in, welcome into the joy of your Lord, he doesn't say welcome into the misery of your Lord, does he? The atmosphere of heaven is full of joy. We should be overflowing with joy. We know where we came from. We know he created us distinctly. Every, every one of us is supposed to be different. We're all beautiful in our different way because he didn't create ugly. Everybody's just a different kind of beautiful. We know that, exactly. And so nobody is ugly. We're a different kind of beautiful. And we know that he has given us gifts to make him known. We know where we're going in the end. So nothing really matters but him. There is nothing that matters. Even if you marry or not marry, it's still all about Jesus, about relationship with him. Because there is no relationship so deep as a relationship with Jesus. Now, when there, there's a depth to a marriage where both are inhabited by the Holy Spirit that you can't reach in a physical But Acts 13.52 says that the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all things. He wouldn't tell us to do that unless he gave us the ability to do it. What does it say? In the presence of God is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, in my experience in the churches that I had been to, everybody expect, expected you to cry and beat your chest and just be terribly sad about it. But in Nehemiah, because God was holy, he said, this day is holy unto the Lord. Therefore, do not weep and do not be sad. Get ready for a party. 
he said, you know, give to people who don't have any food ready, and we're going to celebrate. And they had never heard the word preached ever, like for decades, 20, 30 years. They didn't even know it was in the, the temple when they found it because they were rebuilding the walls, and they just were gathering up the rubble. And they stood from morning till evening listening to the word, and there were runners that went out and translated for them because a lot of them didn't speak the original language. And they wept because they were living what they thought was a good life until they heard the word and compared themselves to it. But the Lord didn't want them to grieve. He told them to be glad and to rejoice because they understood the word. Now, when the Lord shows us the things that need to change, it's because he's getting ready to change them. If you look at what's happening in your life and what's coming out of you, and the Lord says, well, there's an issue there, you go to him and you say, yeah, you confess, which means to agree with God. Confession means to agree with God. You agree with him, yes, I do have an issue. And he's showing that to you because he's going to change it. And he's going to do it in you. Otherwise, he wouldn't have pointed it out. He doesn't point it out to beat you over the head with it. You won't know the miracles that he's done in you unless you know what needs the miracle, right? You don't know that you need healing unless there's something that needs to be healed and you know about it. Um, another thing. We're supposed to enter into the rest of the Lord. Resting in what? Resting in the finished work of the gospel. When, when we intercede, there's no striving. There's no sweat. In fact, intercession is a peaceful thing. It doesn't, when you look at warfare in the world and warfare in the kingdom, you can't compare the two because our rest is a weapon. In the right side up kingdom of God, rest is a weapon. We don't have to say Jesus till the rafters shake. We can whisper it and it has the same effect. We can sit down with a cup of coffee and pray and it has even more effect than it does if we were shouting and sweating because we are we know where our rest comes from and where our faith is. It's in Jesus' finished work. Whenever he cast out a demon, he said, what did he say? Go. Did he stand there and have long conversations and, and, and beat the person until it came out of him? You know, we're supposed to be Christians, little Jesuses. We're supposed to model ourselves after him. We are predestinated to be conformed to the image of Jesus who is inside of us. And so with the word, it says he cast out demons with the word. When he healed, he, he may just touch. He took the hand of the girl and, and raised her up. Nothing loud, nothing boisterous, nothing like, come everybody, see what I'm doing. He said, when you pray, go into your closet and close the door. But what I tell you in secret, speak openly. Because he wants the intimacy. He doesn't want you to pray to get something because those people who have relationship in order to receive something, we know what they're called. It's usually a professional relationship and you have intimacy as a profession and that's not what you want with the Lord. He wants a relationship with you that's so much, so close. People say, well, don't bother God with what you're gonna wear today. I mean, that's silly. No, it's not. He wants to be completely involved in your life. What if somebody is told by the Holy Spirit, they say, okay, I'm praying. I need an answer. They say, well, there's going to be somebody coming by. She's going to be wearing a visor, a red visor or a blue visor, and she's going to come by, and that's the woman who has your answer. But sadly enough, I decided not to wear a visor that day. So she doesn't know which one it is. And I probably have a word for her, but she's never going to come up to me and say, well, I hear the Lord said you have a word for me. Everything we do has an effect in the kingdom of God. We are the risen ones. We have a risen life, one that has never been seen before. Anything can happen at any time because the life that we now live, we live through Christ. 
who gave himself for us. His life is our life now. Anything can happen at any time. It's an exciting life. But the thing is, we keep thinking because we do what we used to do, the, the old habits of our flesh, we think it's still us, but it's not. That's why when you look in the scripture, it says, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are transformed. That's too simple, isn't it? Religion would not have you do that. Religion wants you to look at yourself and check off things, you know. Well, I failed again. But if we behold Jesus and we know that his perfection is inside of us and we develop that love relationship with him, he's not dead. He's alive, very much so. And he's very funny, actually. He is very, very funny. Like one day, somebody said, you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. H.S. said inside of me, you can't be seated without me. And so I was cracking up up there, but a lot of people don't hear what I hear. He's not religious. <laughs> Holy Spirit is not religious. And he's just, the kingdom of God, the atmosphere is more of joy than sorrow. In fact, there are no tears in heaven. And his will, that his will is heaven on earth. Now, religion will have you looking at yourself so much that Jesus will be completely eclipsed. Nobody will even look at him. But he is perfect, perfect in every way. You know, he wasn't handsome. He wasn't tall. He wasn't different from the rest of them. That's why Judas had to kiss him on the cheek so they would even know which one it was. Did anybody ever wonder why? Probably nobody thought. Why did Judas have to kiss him on the cheek for them to know which one it was? He was, the res he was dressed as a carpenter. He wasn't dressed as a teacher. These pictures that they show of him, they don't portray him. He was a simple man who wasn't handsome and tall and he wasn't distinguished from the others. But he was beautiful once you got to know him. You know how some people, to look at them, they weren't very remarkable, but once you get to know them, it says to see one another no longer after the flesh, but after the spirit. If we only start looking at each other after the spirit, we would see the different kind of beautiful come out. You know, in heaven, we're going to be inside out, and we're all going to look like Jesus, so... That's going to be an awesome day. Also, he wanted me to tell uh, y'all that he's not looking for servants. In Romans 8, 29, it says that Jesus was to be the firstborn of many brethren. He wants sons. He wants sons that are in the family business and love him. We take care of his house because it's ours. We take care of the people because they're ours. We, take, we look for those who are going to be reconciled to him because they're his. Not because we want to do check off, I evangelize today. Your life every day is evangelism. Every day. Your smile, even if you never talk to anybody, your attitude, the attitude of your face, the glory that you carry is a bigger message than anything you could speak. Sometimes our mouths get in the way, but the glory of the Lord never makes a mistake. Another thing Deuteronomy does, another thing religion does, it says, the fear, of, fear the Lord and him only shall you serve in Deuteronomy 6.13. But in Luke 4.8, Jesus described that. He said, worship the Lord and him only shall you serve. Because what you fear, you eventually begin to hate. I know that from experience. If you live with somebody that you're terribly afraid of, eventually you hate them. And God never wants us to hate him. The translation of the scriptures, sadly enough, uh, the King James Version, the authorized King James Version, was authorized by King James for the monks to translate. It wasn't authorized by God. And so it's very important that when you do study the scriptures that you know what was meant. Since the joy of the Lord is our strength, joy, joy is an expression of faith 
that celebrates the breakthrough before it comes. But that was what Bill Johnson calls it. But to me, joy is an expression of faith that causes the breakthrough to come because God looks, the Father looks for those he can show himself strong for. He wants you to have joy. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. Now, if that was so valuable that he was willing to go through what he went through, joy is the commodity of heaven. There is no tears or sadness in heaven. So we should have more of an atmosphere of joy in his house than tears. In fact, back in the 90s, whenever um, Rodney Howard Brown was having the, the laughter things, there were so many people up in arms because there was too much joy in the church. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And not only that, joy will heal you. Laughter is medicine. Yes, and God laughs. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given us the ability to laugh since we're created in his image and in his likeness. Have you ever wondered why do we laugh? Ta-da, we're made in his image. You know, it's not even required that a baby smile, but they do. It's not required that a baby laugh, but they do. We are distinctly different from animals. We are not animals. Um, I wanted to share a story, a story about adoption. Because even though a lot of us wouldn't have chosen ourselves, the gospel of grace, the word of Christ, which is the gospel of grace, tells us that a perfect God came to the earth and picked somebody who didn't love them and gave them everything whether or not they were going to love him back or not. That's what's so reckless about his love. He loves without a net. And we're supposed to love without a safety net as well. If you want the heart of God, you're going to have to yield to his love that's inside of you. It says in the scripture that his love is poured out in our hearts. So you can't say, I don't have love, because you'd be calling him a liar. He knows what he put inside of you. He designed each one of us a different kind of beautiful this is the book called uh, The Case for Grace by Lee Strobel, who also wrote The Case for Christ. It's about, it's about a little girl who is a half-breed in Cambodia. Her mother comes to her and says, well, I'm going to have to take you to your uncle's because this man wants to marry me. And in order for him to marry me, I can't have any children. And over there, you had to have a husband to support you. And so she takes her to the train station. And the little girl waits for her uncle to come pick her up at the train station. And he never gets there. She's four years old. And so she sleeps there for a few days, hungry. And he never shows up. After a while, she goes out to the street thinking that maybe if she starts walking, she's going to find her mother, find somebody who will help her, and nobody does. In the end, she meets some other children, and they steal to eat, and then they get caught, and the people put them in a building where there is these large rats, and they know that they're large, and they would actually attack these children. And the next thing you know, she's lying on a trash heap, half dead. And this missionary lady, who's come from the States, who helps orphans in Cambodia, she sees her there. And she's more dead than alive. She's got rat bites all over her. And she barely weighs anything. But this is, she's already seven, eight years old. So she's been out there a long time, skin and bones. And so she picks her up, and she takes her to the orphanage. 
and she gets better. And there's a bunch of babies there, and so they have a lot of Americans that come over to adopt these babies because people love babies to adopt them. And then one day, they say, they tell her, well, there's this American couple that's going to come and they're going to adopt a baby. And so immediately she starts getting to work and she cleans up the babies and gets them all dressed in clean clothes. And she says, the orphanage became a house, but hardly a home. The conditions were primitive, outdoor plumbing, mats for beds, and hundreds of children needing attention. I was one of the oldest ones, and my job became caring for the babies, washing the diapers, hanging up the diapers, folding the diapers, changing the children, putting them on my back while I was working, but I loved the babies. Love, that was a word I hadn't heard during her story about her journey. Was this a new emotion for you, building relationships with the babies, I asked her. Oh yes, when I went into the baby section, they all had their arms out wanting me to hold them. I felt loved. The workers didn't have enough time for all of them, so I would sing to them and hug them and carry them around. Then every once in a while, a baby would disappear. Disappear? Yes, and I would ask where the baby went, and they would say he went to America. Oh, so they were adopted. Well, that's the thing. I didn't know what adoption meant. I just knew that when they said a baby went to America, it was a good thing. So one day, the director said an American couple was coming to pick out a baby boy. I immediately started working to get them ready, brushing their hair, giving them baths, pinching their cheeks, putting them in the best rags we had available. The next day, the bell rang in the compound. A worker opened the door, and it was like a giant was coming in, because you know in Cambodia, children are people are small. Americans are huge. Not only was he tall, but he was massive. Back then in Korea, the only people with extra weight were so rich. So I thought, he must be the wealthiest person on the face of the earth. <laughs> he stepped aside, and Mrs. Giant came in. She wasn't much smaller. They were speaking English and had an interpreter with them. The bassinets were lined up along the hallway, and I watched as the man would pick up a baby and tuck it under his neck. Her face lit up at the memory. I was just overwhelmed by him. I don't think I'd ever seen a man hold a baby like that. He brought the baby right up to his cheek, and he was kissing him and talking to him, and it was just, well, an emotion began to rise in me. I saw him put the baby down and pick up another baby, and what I didn't realize was that I, was that I kept inching closer to him. I was very curious. He put the second baby under his chin, and then I looked into his eyes, and he was crying. And my heart was starting to pump, pump, pump. Something in me said, this is good. He put that baby down and did the same thing with the third one. And the third one, he saw me out of the corner of his eye. He did the same thing, kissing and putting the baby down. And then he turned around to look toward me. And I started backing up. When he looked at you, what was he seeing at that time? Although I was almost nine years old and had been in the orphanage for about two years, I still had dirt on my body, especially my elbows and my knees. It was ground into my skin. I had lice so bad that my head was actually white. I had worms so bad in my stomach that when they got hungry, they'd crawl out of my throat. I had a lazy eye that sort of flopped around in its socket. I couldn't see very well at all, probably from malnutrition. My face was devoid of expression. I weighed a little less than 30 pounds. I was a scrawny thing, and I had boils all over me, as well as scars on my face. And yet still, he came over to where I was. He got down as low as he could, right down on his haunches, and looked straight into my eyes. He stretched out his enormous hand, and he laid it on my face, just like this. She said, closing her eyes, and she tenderly demonstrated with her own hand. His hand covered my whole head. It felt so good and so right. And then he started stroking my face. I sat spellbound as I listened to her story. Here it was, the image of grace I had been seeking, a, a father bringing unconditional acceptance to a child who had absolutely nothing to offer, just herself and all of her vulnerability and scars and weaknesses. My eyes moistened. This is the love and grace of a father. Then something incredible happened. The hand on my face felt so good and inside I was saying, oh, keep that up. Don't let your hand go. But nobody had ever reached out to me that way before. And I didn't know how to respond. What did you do? Her eyes widened as if she were still astonished by her own actions. I yanked his hand off my face. And I looked him in the eye and I spit on him. Twice I spit on him. And then I ran away and hid in a closet. 
spit on him. My mind was reeling. Grace was throwing open a window of opportunity for her, a chance for hope, security, and a future, and she deliberately slammed it shut. How could you do that? She couldn't explain. It was fear. I was called into the director's office, and there was the foreign couple, and she said, oh, I'm going to be in trouble now. They're going to beat the tar out of me. But the interpreter pointed to this man and this woman, these strangers, these foreigners, this enormous man with a huge heart who wept over children, and he said, they want to take you to their house. What struck Stephanie was that this couple easily could have chosen a more likable child, perhaps the baby boy they originally wanted. Nobody would have blamed them. This is the child they want. At the time, I didn't realize that I was being adopted. I thought I was being taken home to become a servant. Does it ring any bells? A servant. Yeah, she could have envisioned that. She could pay off their kindness. Hello? She could pay off their kindness. Isn't that what we try to do? She could earn her room and board. Becoming a servant was the only way she could make any sense of her situation. One day, she, she kept working and working. One day, she, and, and she loved it because she said, you know, because she was here in the States and everything was here. And she said, wow, this is a fun place to work. They even had eggs, which only rich Cambodians could afford. And they kept feeding me, tucking me into bed, buying me new clothes, but never putting me to work. Did that confuse you? Yes, I wondered why for several months, but I was afraid to ask. We'd go into a village, everybody would treat me like I was something wonderful. I couldn't understand. Before I had been a Twiggy, which was uh, less than a dog, but now I was being treated like a princess. Then one day, a girl said, you smell American. And I said, what do you mean? She said, you smell like cheese. <laughs> Cambodian children always said foreigners smelled like cheese. I said, no, I'm not an American, but those Americans are really funny. They haven't put me to work yet. They're really treating me nice. And she looked at me with a surprised expression and said, don't you realize you're their daughter? That idea had never occurred to me. No, I'm not their daughter. She said, yes, yes, you are. You are their daughter. I was astonished. I turned and ran out of the room and up the hill toward my house thinking to myself, I'm their daughter, I'm their daughter, I'm their daughter. Oh, that's why I've been treated this way. That's why nobody's beating me. That's why nobody's calling me a Twiggy. I am their daughter. I ran into the house to my mom who was sitting in a chair, and I declared in Korean, I'm your, in Korean, I'm your daughter. She didn't speak the language yet, but a worker said to my mom, she's saying she's your daughter. With that, big tears began to roll down my mommy's face. She nodded and said to me, yes, Stephanie, you're my daughter. And he said, how did that make you feel? And she threw up her hands and said, there are no words. There are no, simply no words. That's us. That's me. This gospel of the grace is so fantastically wonderful. There are no conditions. Contrary to what the world believes, there are no conditions. He does both sides of it. You don't have to strain to perform, all you have to do is yield to him within you. That's why he said, I will ride on their hearts. I will cause them to do what pleases me. And so tonight, I didn't want to take too long. Since the joy of the Lord is your strength, let me tell you one st another story, one short one. Graham Cook is talking about joy. He was talking about being in the United Kingdom on the way to a meeting, and he passes this man in the hallway, and he says, how, how are you doing? And the guy says, I'm really depressed. And then he comes up to him, and he, s he, he says, oh, no. In his mind, he's saying, oh, no, I have a meeting, but here, this man is depressed, and I can't just walk by. And so all of a sudden, he said, how do you know you're depressed? Did your wife tell you you're depressed? He said, no. Then how do you know? How do you know you're depressed? He said, I just feel down. But he said, 
So because you feel you're down, you think you're depressed. He said, well, I really don't know why I know that I'm depressed. And he said, well, doesn't that kind of make you feel kind of foolish? He said, well, it didn't before, but now that I've met you and you just said that, I really feel foolish. <laughs> now what happens is the enemy, the enemy can see your face. He can't read your mind. The enemy can't read your mind. In fact, he's not everywhere. The enemy has minions. He has little demons that follow you around. They're assigned to you. He can't read your mind, but he can read your face, and he can hear your words. And so what he's going to do, he sounds just like you, by the way. He's, 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 um, he's a ventriloquist. And he sounds like he says, well, nobody really likes you in this room. And then you're like, oh, yeah. See, they're looking at me that certain way. And so, you know, he plays with your mind. And then he says, oh, you really don't feel that good today. I mean, what's the point of getting up even? This is his voice, but it sounds like you talking to yourself. And it's not you. Do not, when the enemy comes, he comes for the words of your mouth. Not just the word out of your mouth, but your words, because your words give him power. When you speak what he tells you to speak, you hear it in your ears and it goes down into your heart. It's what comes out of a man that defiles a man, not what goes in. And so when you hear him say, I'm depressed, why? Why should I be depressed? Every, all my tomorrows are taken care of all the way through eternity and back. I mean, my life is eternal. And when I wake up from this life, I'll have it more eternity to eternity to eternity. And I won't be bored because God is infinite. And so there's stuff I don't even know that I don't know yet. There's a sense. In fact, I was talking to HS the other day. I said, if this world is as beautiful as it is, we have a sense that we're not using yet to experience heaven. And that's true. Because how can we experience heaven with our earthly senses when the world is so beautiful? When you see these pictures of everywhere that he's created for us to look at and be in, and then you think heaven is far beyond that and far beyond what you can imagine, there's a sense that we're not using yet. There's the other 90% of our brain that we're actually going to get to use then. But tonight, I want you to just sit there and be his tonight. No striving, no self-examination, which is the enemy's weapon. The enemy always wants you to look at yourself. Is there anything perfect in you for you to look at besides Jesus? Is there? There isn't. Looking at yourself will not change yourself. That's why it says looking unto Jesus, the source, the author, the finisher of our faith. And in Thessalonians it says, faithful is he who has called you, who also will do it. Where in here does it say change yourself? Tell me, where in the scripture does it say list your faults and your weaknesses and then change them? It doesn't say it anywhere. It says you can come boldly to the throne of grace where you can receive help in time of need. And the crazy thing is people think come boldly to the throne and then you kneel down at his feet and oh, but actually he wants you to crawl up into his lap, put your arms around his neck, and put your head on his chest so he can hear your, you can hear his heart. He wants you to love him. Love wants you to love him. And he's perfect. He will never let you down, ever. Just because he didn't do it the way you thought he would doesn't mean he let you down. Okay? All right. So tonight, um, I just have a song. It's, of course, I just want you to experience him. And nobody looking around, just be his tonight. Stop striving. The only thing he tells us to strive to do is to enter his rest. Even that scripture that says the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Actually, the correct interpretation is the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and our painful striving will not add anything to it, which completely changes it. His blessings are perfect. And so we're going to listen to this amazing music, and we're just going to Smile. I, I won't be looking at you. You, you smile. This, this is the honor thing. You smile at God. 
You don't have to bow your head and you don't have to look up. He's right there inside of you. Oh, does everybody know Jesus as your Savior? Okay, that means that he's already inside of you. So enjoy his presence today and rejoice because you know if you joy in the Lord like he tells you to, your battles are already won anyway. The battle between our head is our ears is actually won too if we finally learn to control this. So, all right, please.
Let's give the Lord some praise for that powerful word. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Man, she's loaded. Amen. <laughs> she's loaded with revelation. But listen, let's walk in freedom. Don't walk under condemnation. Don't walk under guilt. Don't, don't look at your mistakes. Look at Jesus. And don't take the burden of trying to change yourself. Let God change you. And I, he does that. He brings it up, not to condemn you, but to deal with it, to remove it, so you can be all that you can be. Amen? So walk in freedom. Amen? Amen. Good word. Let's give the Lord some praise for that. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Friday night, Apostle Lewis Captavilla, tell somebody about it. Amen. And men, don't forget Saturday, our last men's meeting of the year. Amen. Amen. Let's lift our hands up to the Lord. And if you need prayer, the team will be up here after, after I dismiss. If you need prayer, come on up. Amen. Father, we just thank you for that powerful word, Father. Father, we thank you for our identity in you. And Father God, we thank you that um, let, let us grow in knowing who we are in you. And, Father, grow in our knowledge of you, Father God. And, Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we can walk in joy, 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 joy. Joy, 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 joy. Joy, joy down in my heart, down in my soul. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us.